Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out today. Uh, we just, we're going to go ahead and get started. We know there will be some people that are continuing to wander in. Uh, my name is Dan McConkie. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, I currently represent parts of Crystal Lake at, and then go south and east, but under redistricting, I will unfortunately only be having the southeast of Lake County, Fox River Grove and Algonquin. So it's pre, uh, a real privilege to be able to see so many of you here. Obviously, this is a meeting in regards to the Safety Act. And uh, so normally, how, let me ask, start off with this question. How many of you have a TV? Yeah, right. So obviously right now you've uh, your TV, if you watch, if you actually watch the commercials and don't fast forward through them, uh, lots of stuff that's on TV right now uh, on the campaign side. This is considered an official event. So as a result, uh, there will not be any sort of commentary or any answering of questions about, you know, what do we think of uh, the governor or anything of that sort or what do we see in regards to those. Uh, this is merely about the law that was passed last year that is going to be going to effect on January 1st. And it's an informational meeting with these experts that we have here that uh, will be taking your questions. Uh, so we're see, we're, Senator Wilcox and I are pleased to see so many people here uh, who have taken time to learn the concerns around this controversial new law, uh, because the truth is that the provisions of the Safety Act affect every single person here in Illinois. And it's going to affect our families and our ability to feel safe within our neighborhoods. It affects our law enforcement uh, and the officers and their ability to do their jobs safely and effectively. And it affects our court system, which is charged with implementing a host of contradictory provisions that are uh, an expensive new mandates uh, on very prescribed uh, timelines. So uh, ground rules in regards to this, I just mentioned this is an official event, so we can talk about policy. Uh, we cannot talk uh, really about campaign stuff. Um, we're looking forward to a cordial discussion tonight. Uh, we have had some other meetings across the state in regards to this. There was one last night down in Springfield that became very entertaining with protesters and so forth. Um, but uh, that is not why we're here. We're really here to try to answer your questions. Uh, due to the size of the audience, I would ask uh, for everyone to refrain from clapping, jeering, or shouting out comments uh, because there will be time for Q&A. Uh, we've you know, had cards and so forth that we've asked for people uh, to fill out. The Q&A portion tonight, everybody should have received a card, and you can use that to submit a question. Uh, if you have a question throughout the forum, please write it on the card. Uh, just signal. Staff will be around frequently to collect them. Similar questions may be combined with other people's questions if it's on the same subject in order to save time and ensure that we get to as many questions as possible. Uh, questions only related to the Safety Act and crime will be allowed. Uh, if you have other questions that are outside of that subject, uh, all of us will remain, well, Senator Wilcox and I will remain uh, later tonight if you have questions that you didn't wanted to ask but uh, either didn't get answered or you didn't want to ask publicly in regards to the Safety Act. All of us will be around afterward uh, to be able to speak to people directly. Uh, we do have a closing, hard closing time at 730. Uh, on your card, please put your email address down uh, so we can send you a response to your question if for some reason we don't get to it in time. And uh, we are live streaming this event on Facebook tonight. So those of you that are tuned in at home, uh, please feel, feel free to submit questions in the comments section. And we have staff that will be monitoring that and we'll, we'll relay your questions. So with that, uh, we will get started. Tonight, you're going to hear straight from two of your local experts. Senator Wilcox and I are pleased to introduce two professionals in the field who will be able to speak in detail on behalf of the Safety Act. McHenry County State's Attorney Patrick Keneally. I pronounced that right. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, that's right. I, I practiced. That's right. All right. And Crystal Lake Police Chief James Black are the two people who will be responsible for implementing provisions uh, that are within the act, and they've both spent a great deal of time coming through it and understanding it. But first, we'll kick it over to Senator Wilcox. So thank you. Um, before we turn it over to the experts, I just want to talk a little bit about the legislative process that normally occurs and then what occurred with this bill. Uh, in the legislature, at the beginning of each General Assembly, we adopt the rules uh, for the General Assembly. And those rules often require things like transparency for the public, uh, for the movement of bills through the legislative process. 
that includes prescribing a time period for filing bills, uh, one committee hearing, three separate readings of bills on the floor. However, those rules often have loopholes written into them, and that allows lawmakers to sidestep some of those processes uh, in the case of avoiding transparency or in the time of expediency, and that's what happened with this bill. The Safety Act was written, uh, as we're told, over the course of many months. Um, we're told that because we weren't a part of that writing process, nor were many organizations in law enforcement and the state's attorneys. Um, so it was never properly vetted. The one story I remember as a freshman legislator, we get to talk to the Supreme Court justices. And they impressed upon me the reason we have this transparency is to give the public input and for debate to occur. And when that happens, they can then go back to those debates and judge legislative intent. If we don't have the debates and they can't get legislative intent, they're stuck purely with the letter of the law. And I can tell you after four years, we are not the best, even with staff and LRB, Legislative Research Bureau, at getting legislation written as appropriate as possible. And we'll, we'll talk about this bill and where that comes into play. So no legislative hearings, no debate that may have resolved some of the contentious issues that we're talking about. And then avoiding that transparency, we go into what's called a lame duck session. We'll do that again this January at the end of an assembly time post-election. So you have legislators there who've lost an election or resigning or retiring, uh, no longer accountable to their constituents, exercising votes during that time period. The interesting part is during lame duck, you only require a simple majority, whereas during veto session, which we'll go into November, requires a supermajority to pass things. There were no fewer than eight legislators that were considered lame ducks that voted to pass the Safety Act, which only passed by a couple votes and had bipartisan non-support of the bill. Um, as a result, we have had a couple of trailer bills to try and fix things uh, within this act, and there has been a lot of talk. Both sides have acknowledged that changes need to be made to the Safety Act before implementation on January 1st. The problem is, we don't know what those changes may be, so we are preparing for the bill to be enacted on January 1st as is. We do have one bill that's been filed by a downstate senator that I don't believe has been read in, so not technically available to the public, it's not posted on ILGA, that may address some of the challenges, but we also know there's already opposition to even those changes. So it will be a contentious uh, discussion going forward. Um, anyhow, we're going to turn it over to our speakers, who ultimately for McHenry County are two of those who run organizations that are charged with implementing what is in the legislation that was signed into law that goes into effect on January 1st. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce State's Attorney Patrick Keneally. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Pat Keneally. I'm the McHenry County State's Attorney. I've uh, been the McHenry County State's Attorney for uh, six years, since 2016. Uh, I am happily married, live in Crystal Lake, and have four uh, boys, and you all got me out of soccer practice tonight. So thank you all uh, very much. But of course, I'm thrilled to be here. I love these types of things. I think... Um, what uh, I've been doing a lot more um, and just sort of as I've been just sort of going back and thinking about how is it that something like the Safety Act passed and don't get me wrong, this is not like the, you may have heard this is going to be the purge or uh, that this is end of times, things like that. Uh, that's not true. Uh, there are even some things in the act that I personally agree with and would endorse. Okay, So body cameras would be one of those things. I'm a fan uh, of body cameras. I think it enhances uh, law enforcement and it makes my job as a prosecutor easier to do. So that would be one thing, for example, that um, I think is terrific. But uh, when it comes to what they've done with uh, with their vision of bail, you just sort of have to think like how like how did something like this happen? And um, I and myself am sort of like a reformer, you know, or I, that's what I sort of consider myself. But I'm in a position these days really to defend the criminal justice system because there's so much misinformation out there about how things actually work in the criminal justice system and how people like me 
Chief Black, law enforcement have been portrayed, uh, I think is uh, disgraceful. Um, so one of the things that you may have heard, and this is this is J.B. Pritzker, I'm not saying this in a, in a partisan way, okay? But one of the things that he said with regard to this, and he said it at the debate, he said, listen, if there's a woman, a pregnant woman, who is arrested for a misdemeanor offense for stealing diapers, she could sit in the jail for six months while she's awaiting trial. And I'm saying to myself, what? Does, has he read the, that is not true, that's not even close to true. If you're in McHenry County, if you're arrested on a, on a misdemeanor retail theft, your bond is going to be $2,000 with 10% to apply, which means that you have to pay $200 in order to get out. Every single day she's in custody, she gets, 40 day, she gets $40 credit. All that means is that the max amount of time that that woman could have spent in jail is five days. But now let's talk about reality, okay? I am not a monster, okay? Chief Black is not a monster. Judges are not monsters. It is not my intention to cast people into the darkness of the Illinois Department of Corrections for their first nonviolent offense, for their first drug offense, for their second nonviolent offense, for their fifth nonviolent offense, for their fifth drug possession offense. That's not how it works, okay? If you're looking at the Illinois Department of Corrections, look at the statistics and look at the number of prior arrests on average that people have. So for example, a drug arrest, all right? The vast majority of people who are in the Illinois Department of Corrections are there on severe drug trafficking offenses, okay? For those defendants that are there on a drug possession offense, and they like to hold the, the nonviolent drug offender who just has personal use and is suffering from a disease, and we need to put them in the public health system as opposed to the criminal justice system, the average person who's there has been arrested 19 prior times, okay? Six prior times for a felony. And I can assure you that prior, that prior arrests included drug offenses. And what does that mean? That means that we gave them the best available options in this community for drug rehabilitation. Not once, not twice, not three times, very oftentimes not four times, five times, but multiple opportunities that this person did not avail themselves of. And when you're talking about people who are using heroin and fentanyl, their continued use because of the devastation that that types of things wrought in communities in networks, among peers, et cetera. Devastating communities that includes death, all right? Very often includes death. It's intolerable. So at some point, there has to be a backstop. At some point, there has to be accountability, and that's the Illinois Department of Corrections. So we're given these archetypes where, which is the, which is the pregnant woman or the uh, nonviolent drug offender and, uh, and all the rest, and, peop and then they globalize these stories and they say, oh, this is what the criminal justice system is and this is why we need to make these expansive extent. We need to reimagine the criminal justice system. The criminal justice system is a balance of interests, okay? On one hand, you have liberty of defendants and you and on the other hand you have the safety of the community on one hand you have rehabilitation on the other hand you have retribution and justice okay and if one group is happy with how the criminal justice system is working that means it's not working at all every single person should be unhappy at some point with how the criminal justice system works because that's how you know it's working for everybody in a community and so what's now happened with regard to some of this bail stuff is we've gone so ideological and we've we've divorced ourselves from reality so bad with respect to who people are that are committing these offenses all right and we want to hold them out as victims but many of them do not care at all about your rights not at all they don't care about your right to life they do not care about your right to liberty they do not care about your property and so and when they do and when they express that and when they show that multiple times after another, we have to be able to take these pe people out of society for a term, for our protection, and a lot of times for their own good, all right? Um, so the two biggest things that I see as a problem for bail is number one, it is true, and many of the advocates and many of what the advocates say is true, that for some offenses, we can detain people, all right? These are the most violent offenses. These include things like murder, attempted murder, terrorism. It also includes things like domestic battery, all sex crimes, all right? And then it also includes drug crimes, okay? That's less than 10% of the offenses in the criminal code.
right? The 90 plus other offenses in the criminal code, it doesn't matter how dangerous a judge thinks that person is going to be. It doesn't matter whether a judge believes that that person is going to tamper with the process of justice by virtue of the fact that they are going to harass witnesses or be a danger to witnesses. It doesn't matter if the judge thinks that that person is going to come to court or not going to come to court. We cannot detain that person. And that would be crimes like second degree murder. That would be crimes like vehicular hijacking. That would be crimes like hate crimes. That would be crimes like window peeping. That would be crimes like drug-induced homicide. That would be crimes like DUI causing death. So if some, so the, and this is no, under the law, all right? If somebody leaving this event who's under the influence of alcohol, all right, crashes into a family of five and kills that family and shows up the next day in court and says, Judge, I have an alcohol problem, and I need to get to work, and I, there's, I, I'm going to continue to drive, and I va may very well drink. A judge cannot hold that person under this law, all right? Now, I do expect, as Senator Wilcox said, that there are going to be changes to it, but we need to face the reality. And one of the things that I've seen is every single time I point out the problems of this law, is everybody say, oh, that's disinformation, that's ridiculous. And I'm like, come here. All of you are welcome to come to my office. I'll show you the statute book. We'll go through the statute together, and I'll explain to you how it's not. And it's kind of chilling because I, re I remember being like, well, they, I remember they were like, well, it doesn't create these detainable versus non-detainable offenses. And I'm like, no, it does create these detainable and non-detainable offenses. Well, the Associated Press did a fact check, and they asked a Syracuse professor whether or not it created an associate, and she said that it didn't. I'm thinking to myself, it, it's... There was the first time something like that had happened to me, and I had heard, you know, I'm a Republican, so I, sometimes I watch Fox News and I hear about, like, you know, the fact-checking gone awry or whatever. Uh, but that was the first time that it actually happened to me, and so I'm thinking to myself, like, this is crazy that an apparatus such as the Associated Press is, go it, when, uh, is, going, to, is going to put out information that is clearly wrong and disingenuous and then call what I'm saying misinformation. And that was the first time that I sort of cynically kind of, th that I thought to my myself like, you know, how things are done, especially in Springfield, but also it's, it's very cynical and it's very chilling. Um, and so uh, that is uh, my uh, opening salvo, and um, I'll turn it over uh, to you. And, and again, please ask, ask the questions. I, I thank Senator um, uh, Conchi as well as Senator Wilcox for including me in this event. Um, I've always admired these two guys, um, and uh, I appreciate them uh, having this available for citizens because uh, having these discussions and me and Chief Black and the senators being confronted with things that you think we're not telling the truth about, I just think is really, really important. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, our second expert speaker tonight is Crystal Lake Police Chief James Black. At the time the Safety Act was written, Chief Black was the president of the Illinois Associations of Chiefs of Police. So, Chief, the floor is yours. Thank you, Leader and Senator. So um, I'm a bit under the weather tonight, so I'm not going to talk super long so I can uh, keep my voice and hopefully answer some questions. So as, as Leader mentioned, so um, I kind of got thrust in the mix post-George Floyd um, during civil unrest, the pandemic, and then uh, police reform as president of Illinois Chiefs. Um, I was the primary negotiator for law enforcement for um, the uh, – decertification bill for law enforcement officers in which we worked with the uh, Attorney General's office on and that bill later got hijacked and changed and um, immersed into um, the House bill now known as uh, as the Safety Act. So um, I can talk a little bit later on um, if you have specific questions about um, how that process went. Um, I did testify in the Senate and the House um, during the lame duck session um, so I am unfortunately very familiar and scarred from the 764 piece uh, page uh, piece of uh, legislation. Um, but some of the things right now that that we're most concerned with um, uh, from a law enforcement standpoint. And let me reverse one second. So um, obviously Pat and uh, and Leader McConkey and uh, Senator Wilcox are are elected and they report to you. So I got to throw the disclaimer out. Um, I'm appointed by the city manager of, uh, of the city of Crystal Lake. And so my views are my opinion and that of law enforcement, not necessarily the views of the, uh, the city of Crystal Lake per se. So I'm here in a law enforcement capacity this evening. Um, so one of the biggest things that we're trying to fix right now is class B and C misdemeanors. 
So you, you've heard a lot of this discussion about, um, so criminal trespass to property is a Class B misdemeanor. Currently, right now, until January 1st, um, that is a custodial arrest detainable offense. Um, they want to make it where we can't um, detain them anymore, we can't arrest them, uh, which essentially means that um, we can't remove them from your property. Someone could pitch a tent in your front yard, um, and I can come and ask them to leave, and if they say no, I can give them a citation, um, but that's about all that I can do. Um, at least that is most of law enforcement's interpretation of the way this bill has been written. There's been some discussion on, well, um, maybe we can, if, if you give them a lawful order and they, uh, and they don't leave, uh, well, then we charge them with obstructing justice. Um, you know, the senators and, and the state's attorney, um, they have uh, immunity for their actions. So we can charge, and if a judge throws it out, then we're possibly opening ourselves up to malicious prosecution. Um, so, um, State Street Keneally is, is very uh, aggressive in, uh, in prosecutions in, in the county, so I trust that that won't happen, but a lot of times we don't control what the judges do either, um, and I can't say that it might not occur in Cook or Lake or, or, or other counties where maybe they aren't as aggressive in, in how they prosecute. Um, there's another... Uh, there's other things that we need changed in, in the bill that we've been trying to work on um, from a trailer bill standpoint. Um, I know Pat is going to probably, he already mentioned a lot of the pretrial release and bail reform issues. That's in his wheelhouse. He's the expert on, uh, on that. Um, I don't determine whether or not someone gets uh, it released or, uh, or bonded on that. But it does create some issues for us because there is a possibility that come January 1st, we might not know, um, you know what we're doing with somebody when we charge them with a felony. So a misdemeanor arrest and a felony arrest are two totally different. I don't need the state's attorney's approval to charge someone with a mean misdemeanor. I develop probable cause, make an arrest, bring them down to the station, we book them, and then um, we either recognizant bond them or they post bond. Felony, I have to get state's attorney approver, approval on that felony charge. So the big question is going to be now, it's probably going to take more time for my officers to develop, um, what do we do now when we arrest someone for a felony? We can bring them down to the station, we can uh, fingerprint and, and photograph them, but I'm sure we're going to have to spend more time in, in discussing um, issues with the, uh, the felony screener on whether or not this person meets the criteria um, to be detained. And that, in turn, takes my officers off the street for, uh, for a longer period of time. Um, there are some other um, just language issues with less than lethal weapons, um, uh, the decertification process. Um, there's still some cleanup that we would like um, in the uh, body-worn camera language. Um, and then there's a big one, too, that we wanted to have changed is the, uh, the Safety Act allows the Attorney General to bring a cause of action against police officers for what they consider uh, civil rights pattern and practice uh, violations. And if an officer is, um, is found to have violated someone's rights, where right now there is a legal recourse for the person whose rights have been violated, where they can file a civil suit against somebody, now it's almost like a double jeopardy where the officer can potentially get fined $25,000 for a first offense and $50,000 for each subsequent offense after that. And the law doesn't differentiate whether that is compensatory or punitive, so we're reading it as that's going to have to be paid by the officer and not necessarily the, the municipality. So there, there are a lot of issues um, that still need to, uh, to be cleaned up with this. Um, you know, when I was president, um, you know, and I'll say it again today, you know, reform's not a bad thing. Um, you, you know, we, we need to reform. I'm sure with all of you in your current jobs, right, you probably didn't do things now like you did 20 years ago, right? You evolved into uh, what was a best practice, and those are issues that you did to serve your company or serve your customers or what have you. There's no difference th than with us. You know, we can't do the same things that we did in, in, the, uh, in the 80s and 90s. We have to evolve as a profession as well and, and do better and make sure that we're continuing to meet the needs of, uh, of our residents. So reform is not bad. It just needs to be done the right way. And what we've tried to tell <clears throat> some of the proponents of this bill originally was 
tell us where you want to be and we'll give you the language to get there. But they never did it. They took, they wrote their own piece of legislation and they rammed it through at four o'clock in the morning um, on the last day of the, uh, the lame duck session. Um, so um, that's my experience and that's kind of some of the things that we need to see changed. Um, but I'll turn it over to the senators now and then I'm happy to any, answer any questions that you may have from a law enforcement standpoint on the Safety Act. Great. Thank you, Chief Black. Uh, as a reminder, you were given cards if you came in. Some of you have already turned in some questions. Thank you very much for doing that. Uh, if you have somebody, we have somebody up here in the front. Uh, just raise, yeah, raise your hand like that and staff will come by and, and pick them up. And if they are not unique, they may get merged into another one. All right, so uh, we're going to go right into questions right away here because we have a, a good stack. So this is a question uh, from Ray from McHenry. If someone trespasses on your property or manages to get into the house and will not leave on their own, can police arrest them and take them away? And similarly, I've also heard uh, questions about what can people do in defense of their own property and how does that differ from what law enforcement uh, is able or not to do? So there's, there's really two criminal <clears throat> components to the question. A trespass is different than someone entering your home. That's burglary, which is a felony. So we can arrest for that and take someone in custody and bring them down to the station. As I mentioned earlier, though, uh, trespassing to your property, if they're just standing on your front yard and, and they won't leave, um, after January 1st, um, we're not going to be able to um, arrest and remove them from your property. The only thing that we can do is cite them and, and try and get them to comply and, and leave the property. No, the, you, it's similar to where, you know, in Crystal Lake, 99% probably of our car burglaries are, uh, are because the doors were left unlocked in the driveway. So this will be my public service address announcement. Lock your cars if they're uh, in your driveways. Um, but that's still considered a, a burglary to motor vehicle because the intent was to enter and commit a theft. So al along with that, uh, Robin had a question, which was, is it true? And I'm reading this exactly as she wrote it. Uh, is it true that a person can break into my home, kill or rape someone, and have 48 hours before they will be arrested or looked for? What are my rights as to shooting them dead for defending myself? I'm let you answer yeah. That. Thank you, Chief, for the privilege of, of answering that question. Uh, no, that's not true, okay? So if somebody commits a offense... Uh, a forcible felony offense, that would be what's called home invasion. So somebody has entered your home with the intention of committing a felony. That's a forcible offense for which a, a sentence must be imposed. So that would be one of the detainable offenses. As soon as they are arrested, they'd be brought before a judge, at which time, at which time we have to file a petition. Now, there's one caveat. And th has everybody heard about sort of the specific identifiable person language? I'm seeing some people sort of nod their head. So it, the statute was uh, written in such a hurried and haphazard manner that there's a lot of language that's not clear. But if you look at the section where the state needs to file a petition in order to detain somebody for one of the offenses that we can detain them for, the language there is that we have to prove that the defendant is a danger to a specific identifiable person. Okay, So let's take uh, the... Uh, example that was posed in the question. Somebody breaks into somebody's home and murders that person, okay? So now they're going to be arrested, all right? And they're going to go before a judge the next day, all right? So we as the state bear the burden of what's called proof. So we have to produce evidence and, and we, have, we bear the burden of production as well as proof. So we have to produce the evidence and then we have to argue convincingly enough whereby a judge actually agrees with us. So with less than 24 hours, we have to be in front of a judge and we have to be capable of proving that this defendant, who we may know little about, is a danger to a specific identifiable person. And the problem is that if the person who they killed appears to be the primary person who they were a danger to, 
then we may not have met our burden and a judge will then be forced to release that person under the law. But there's some conflicting language in some other sections of the statute that says that you can detain somebody if they are a danger to any person. So, uh, we, and we can make the argument that, look, simply by virtue of the fact that this person committed this heinous offense, they are a danger to a specific identifiable person. You judge me, uh, you know, the person at the, and so I think that we're going to have some leeway, and that's certainly something that we can argue, but depending on the judge and depending on how that section is interpreted, from judge to judge, courthouse to courthouse, county to county, you could get some strange conflicting opinions as well as some conflicting results that could result again in people who have done heinous, horrific things uh, being released pretrial before the rehabilitative and and retributive elements of the criminal justice system have a chance to uh, apply. Um, so the next question uh, is, will lawsuits alone be enough to reverse the potential ne negative effects of the Safety Act? So I'll start before I let you talk about what you can in regards to the lawsuits. But no, lawsuits alone, um, not enough. Obviously, we've talked about the potential for trailer language either in veto or in lame duck or in the next General Assembly. Arguably, I think the preference would be to get legislative language that is both constitutional clear and not ambiguous and effective uh, in place. But silent that with the law written the way it is and ready to go into effect with no known changes, uh, I'll let the state's attorney talk to the lawsuits that have been filed and what that process might look like. Yeah, so uh, the McHenry County State's Attorney's Office is one of 50 uh, counties that has filed a lawsuit um, seeking to declare the Safety Act unconstitutional. And just real quick and not getting into too much legalese or technical language, we're essentially challenging the statute on mostly two grounds. One is that it violates the single subject rule. So in the Illinois Constitution, all legislation has to relate to a single subject, right? And this makes sense because you don't want to pass a 764-page bill in the dead of night that nobody has had a chance to read that relates to 200 different subjects. Rather, we want, as citizens, our legislatures to have the chance to consider each piece of legislation on its own merits and debate each piece of legislation on, an, on its own merits. We also don't want pork barrel legislation, which is you take a bunch of different types of legislation, pack it that, every, that, that individually everybody can agree to parts of, pack it into one big Frankenstein type bill and then pass it forward with enough votes. So you're basically, uh, you, so, so you're taking provisions that individually don't have enough support to pass, packing it in with other things so that you fundamentally get uh, the enough support in other passes. So that's the point of the single subject bill. Again, this sprawling piece of legislation uh, that relates to a number of different subjects, we believe violates the single subject rule. And um, truthfully, I feel very good about that uh, part of the lawsuit. I, I do think that that is something that we should, based on current law, win on. But of course, ultimately, you can never predict uh, legal outcomes. The second thing is uh, separation of powers ground. So if you just sort of look traditionally at what what is the purpose of bail? So, so when bail started back in England, the idea is is that you have this person in like this weird liminal sort of in between state. And again, this is where I talk about the criminal justice system being a balance. So you have somebody where we have probable cause to believe that they've committed an offense, right? But at the same time, they're presumed innocent. So it's like, so what do we do with that? person. Uh, and by virtue of the fact that they've been charged, they have an incentive not to appear for court because they want to avoid the criminal penalties. So many of them flee. So the solution that they came up with is, well, let's incentivize them to stay and comply with the process of the court. And how we're going to do that is we're going to require them to put down a cash deposit that they'll forfeit should they flee. All right. So that's generally speaking the um, the uh, underlying basis of cash bail. So the whole, so, 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 so what are we trying to accomplish with bail? We're trying to accomplish the, the effective administration of the justice system. Who is in charge of administering the justice system? Is it the judiciary or is it the legislature? It's the judiciary, okay? So by passing this bill, they have 
unduly trenched upon the power of the judiciary in such a way that it's a separation of powers. And so that really is the other type, uh, that I think that really is the other basis uh, of these lawsuits. Um, can, you, can you talk about the restitution portion of bail to victims? Yeah, so, one, so if you're looking at, so, what, so when somebody pays cash bail, if they're found not guilty or if the case is dismissed, 90% of the money is returned. There is like a transactional fee, uh, but that's a whole other separate thing. But 90 plus percent of the money is given back to the defendant. But for those defendants who are found guilty or who plead guilty, that money goes and is applied to restitution. Okay, that's the first thing that it goes to is restitution for the victims. If there's enough money there, or if there is no restitution for a victim, then it goes to paying fines and it goes to paying court costs. So if you look at uh, the percentage of restitution in this county that is paid by bail, it's like 80%. All right, most defendants, when they have an order of judgment against them for fines and court costs, do not pay those fines and court costs. And by virtue of the fact that our criminal justice system does not allow for debtors' prisons, there's not a lot we can do about that except for close the case and take judgment against the defendant, which affects their credit. And it's also an enforceable civil penalty, but we still have to close the case. So the vast majority of the restitution that is going to victims of crime actually comes from cash bail. So uh, Brandon had a question from Island Lake had uh, a series of questions as to whether or not someone would be uh, free without bail with various different crimes. So the first one was first degree murder. Uh, no, provided we file a petition and prove that he's a that the person is a danger to a specific identifiable person and there are no set of conditions the court can impose upon the defendant such as electronic monitoring such as having to report to probation uh, do drug testing etc that could ensure that they comply with the law and comply with the process of court second degree murder uh, has to be released cannot be held under any circumstances uh, manslaughter. Uh, there's there's such the thing called involuntary manslaughter. Uh, that's a class three felony. Has to be released. Uh, armed robbery. Uh, if it's aggravated armed robbery, that's a class X felony, um, and uh, a lot of times that means that they've like discharged a weapon or exercised the use of force. Uh, that's the class X felony. They can be detained for aggravated armed robbery, but armed robbery uh, is a class one felony. Has to be released. Rape. Uh, rape, you can be detained, again, provided we prove danger to a specific identifiable person, no set of conditions can ensure compliance. Is that because sexual crimes are treated differently? All sex crimes are eligible for detention, which is good. Uh, kidnapping. Uh, kidnapping is, well, there's aggravated, there's different forms of kidnapping, but for most forms of kidnapping, no. Uh, no, I mean, well, uh, I, it's hard. It's kind of hard to answer. I guess it sort of depends because if the victim's not found, a lot of times that bodes more severe charges. Intimidation. Uh, intimidation is a class four felony. Cannot be detained. Arson. Uh, aggravated arson can be detained. Uh, regular arson cannot be detained. <laughs> um, uh, threatening a public official, I do is yeah no threatening a public official is a non detainable offense. And so along these lines, uh, Marianne from Facebook had asked if you could list the non detainable crimes that are most concerning. Did we just pretty much go through I all think of so. them? So I would say so. There's no so for if for anybody charged with a drug offense cannot be detained. Okay, so you're a significant trafficker of drugs or you're charged with what's called drug-induced homicide, which means that a drug that you delivered has recently killed somebody. Uh, you cannot be detained, okay? Uh, I think the DUIs are also very, very concerning. So fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth DUI cannot be detained. Aggravated DUI causing death cannot be detained. Uh, those would be a few of the ones that I think are most concerning. What do you think, Chief? 
Yeah, I, w- I would agree. Uh, <clears throat> you know, a, a lot of it is the unknown right now. Um, you know, we'll go through the, the checklist and working with the state's attorney's office, and ultimately it's up to the judges to determine whether or not some of these offenses are, are detainable or not. So um, it, it's going to be a crapshoot. We'll, we'll wait and see what happens in, uh, in January. Um, Jamie asked, can we address some of the statements on the handout that we received outside when we got here? So I don't know how many of you uh, received one of those. I know the state's attorney has one in front of him and may go through a couple of the uh, the items. Um, sure. So, um, uh, well, let's start with every major victim's advocacy group supports ending cash bail. So that's not true. And even if, so let's, so there was recently a letter that uh, advocacy groups published um, that set, that were opposed to this new Senator Bennett bill that Senator Wilcox uh, brought up, okay? And if you look at the letterhead, it's got these seven organizations. So I just did a little exercise, and I, and I went to uh, the comptroller site, all right? And I said, and I said, and I just did a search for these organizations, and I said to myself, how much uh, money do these organizations get in state funding every single year, right? And, uh, you know, since July, there wasn't a single organization, July of this year, that hadn't received $200,000 plus from the state, okay? And so, I'm, I, and so I don't have any evidence of this, but I do think that, that and the senators could probably uh, speak to this more so than I can, but it doesn't seem to me to be beneath the legislature the 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 legislator in springfield to to uh not overtly but for there to be uh some um you know uh understanding that if there is not support of certain initiatives that people in springfield find incredibly important and uh flagship proposals of their agenda that that could have an effect on how uh, state funding is dished out. So many of these organizations uh, may be supporting this this legislation at the point of a knife. But if you really look in and you drill down on some of these organizations, most of them are domestic violence organizations. And what the bill does a good job of is it allows us as prosecutors to detain defendants who are charged with all domestic violence related offenses, uh, which would include misdemeanors. But what they don't tell you is that um, what, wh- how the system currently works is it's a de facto hold, no hold system. So a judge, when they're speaking with the defendant at rights court, is they're gathering information with regard to what the bond is that a defendant can pay. And if they want to hold the defendant, they set bond at a level that they cannot pay. So to suggest that right now there's no way that we can ever hold a defendant for a domestic violence related offense is just simply not true. Very oftentimes the bonds that are set are prohibitive of a person being released. Um, so we already have that power right now. Before you go to any more, I want to make clear um, we do not have these pieces of paper. They're not uh, part of the official structure. They were handed out outside um, by proponents of the Safety Act to give you something to consider if you heard the different things uh, while you were here. So question in regards to that, the governor has uh, indicated that the, this is a better system because the current system allows for the wealthy to buy their way out of jail and, and continue to be a threat in, on uh, people in society. Uh, rather than um, allowing judges to keep anyone who is a threat in jail, regardless of their ability to pay. Can you comment on that? Sure. So I am, so again, when you're talking about bail, the whole idea is the person probable cause to believe they've committed an offense, uh, but uh, hasn't been presumed guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I Part of my job is to uphold the constitutional rights of a defendant. It is very important to me that during this period, we maximize a defendant's liberty. Okay, it's, uh, it, it's very important to me that as many people who are charged with the crime before they've been convicted 
are released from custody. That's very important to me. That's part of my job. That's 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 something uh, that I consider it my duty to try to enlarge as much as I possibly can. McHenry County, we've done that. Okay, so j like offhand, what percent? Just somebody scream out. What percentage of the defendants charged in McHenry County do you think we hold pretrial? Okay, 90, we hold 3%, okay? 97% of the defendants in McHenry County that are charged with the crime are released pretrial on cash bail. And the reason that, that, and the vast majority of those people are indigent or men and women of modest means, okay? And the reason that they do this is because judges recognize who's a danger and who's not. Most people who are charged with the crime probably are not a danger of reoffending while they have a while they have a charge hanging over their head. And so what a judge does is again they, they have conversations with people at rights court and they say how much cash can you pay? And the person says, "Well, I could pay a bond of $100." Fine, we're going to set a bond at $1,000, 10% to apply. It's a $100 bond, you can be released. If they say, "I can't pay any money," then for, for except for inveterate criminals, a judge is going to give that person what's called a recognizance bond, whereas they're released without paying any money whatsoever. All right. Now, where we get into trouble is, and and so they 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 put this out as like this moral tale, which is, oh, we have this criminal justice system that just rewards the rich on the backs of poor people. What what I'm trying to express to you with the 97 percent is that's just simply not true. There are instances where people of means, charged with serious crimes are able to pay incredibly high bails to the tune of $100,000, $200,000, $300,000, whereas people who are charged with the same incredibly serious offenses are not. So the legislature's solution to this under the Safety Act, in many regards, is just to say, hey, let's let the dangerous defendant out of jail to receive parity with the rich defendant, Instead of just saying, no, we're going to keep the rich defendant in jail along with the dangerous defendant who may not have the same means. So the whole point is when you're looking at the Safety Act, we need to be making decisions about who's released versus who's not released based on risk, not based on arbitrary categories of different types of crime. There's been some statements made that bail reform in other states uh, and New Jersey is often cited as an example, is a better way to go because it gets rid of bail while also giving judges discretion to do that in a manner that the Safety Act does not. That's an argument that I've heard. So I think um, the New Jersey model is a good one. And, and, and I'll even say I don't necessarily think that getting rid of cash bail is the worst thing. I think that there are models that you can use. But think about it this way, okay? So you, so let's say, um, let's say Keneally's charged with uh, a crime, which is not too much of a stretch in fairness. But let's say Keneally's charged with a crime, all right? And it's a, it's a moderate crime. It's a, it's a misdemeanor level offense. So a judge is going to be saying to themselves, okay, uh, I, got, I got him before me, and I want to ensure that he complies with the process of the court, um, and I want to make sure that he's not going to be a danger to anybody, all right? So I can't set money bail, but I don't just want to let him go. So you know what? I'm going to give him an ankle monitor, and I'm going to make sure that he is, and I'm going to set a curfew for him where he has to be home at 8 o'clock, okay? I have not been convicted of any crime, and yet now I'm saddled with an ankle monitor, and I have to be home at 8 o'clock as a 44-year-old adult male, as if I have some type of curfew. I would much rather, okay, pay a $500 bond than be saddled with an ankle monitor, all right? The whole idea of bail is to maximize liberty while creating the incentive for the defendant to come back, okay? Um, so I, so I, I do, so if you look at the New Jersey model, I think, it's an, I think it's a good model. They've completely eliminated cash bail, but they haven't arbitrarily set these categories of detainable versus non-detainable. If you took this bill with some other changes and you just said, look, why don't we let a judge make decisions on an individual basis and on the individual facts of the defendant before him, whether or not it's a hold, no hold system, I, I think there's some problems with that, but I think that's something that we could all live with. Um, 
but um, but it, it, but in in my estimation, I think you keep cash bail for uh, lower level felonies as well as misdemeanors. And when it comes to more serious offenses, class three and up felonies, you go to a New Jersey type of model hold, no hold type system. Um, going to try and modify two questions here. Uh, one talks about will the new law turn law-abiding citizens into criminals, but then given the confusion that likely will reign even after January 1st, uh, uh, Chief, could you talk about the level of force that a homeowner could use to remove someone from their property slash or to remove someone from their house or garage and at what point do they likely become a criminal under the statute in that force? Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you never want to take the law into your own hands. I mean, we've seen how that has backfired um, on a lot of people um, across the nation. Um, if you try and forcibly remove someone your, from your property and you put your hands on them, that's a battery. If they want to sign a complaint against you, you could be the one getting arrested for a class A misdemeanor, which I can put handcuffs on you and take you to jail, and that person can stay in your front yard still after I remove, after I remove you. So you want to be real careful with, with that. Leave that up to us and let us try and figure a workaround on that. Don't put yourselves in, uh, in jeopardy. Um, you know, you look at all the violence that's occurring right now. I mean, you, people have concealed carry permits and, and people don't have concealed carry permits. And those are the ones that are, are shooting the heck out of everyone right now. Um, and you just don't want to jeopardize yourself or your family by putting yourself in, in that position. So you're better off leaving it to us to let us handle it. One caveat on that, I've heard some project that the sale of German Shepherd, Doberman, Doberman Pinchers, Pit Bulls, other very aggressive but yet well-trained dogs could come into play. What is a homeowner's responsibility if they have a well-trained aggressive dog that they release to remove someone from their property. What is a homeowner's responsibility in that situation? Well, <laughs> well again, you, you know, what the state's attorney's office looks at is criminal intent, right? So is this, was your Doberman out in the front yard and do you have a, um, a wireless fence and did someone come on your property and the dog attacked them? That's a little bit different. If, if you're sicking the dog on, on somebody that's on your property, you're probably going to end up getting yourself in, uh, in trouble by uh, doing that because now you've intended to inflict bodily harm on that person that's on your property, even though they're not supposed to be there. But um, I, again, that's probably not a wise choice. So I heard if the well-trained dog is out amongst the property and handles it on their own as opposed to being given a command to do something. We're going to uh, try to run through uh, a few questions kind of quickly here just to make sure we get to as many as possible. Uh, Joanne in Johnsburg asked, I'm wondering why this town hall wasn't held before this was voted on. Uh, there was not a lot of uh, forewarning in regards to this. As was mentioned, this was done during the lame duck session of last year. So this was done in, in early January. We actually voted on it at 430 in the morning. 700 plus pages, did not have a chance to read it. You may hear from advocates that there was many hearings before that. There were theoretical hearings about what we might want to put together, but there was never any sort of debate about an actual bill. You, can you just comment briefly on uh, how much you were at the table or your uh, respective associations, state associations were at the table? Chief Black, you were around at the time. Yeah, um, you know, it's funny because actually Pat and I were talking to each other um, at like 11 o'clock or midnight um, the night that we figured it was going to go for a vote. And, uh, you know, what I can tell you is that when we originally started our negotiations with the attorney general, and I'm not trying to be partisan here or not, but he truly was inclusive in, in the process. We were at the table, state's attorneys were at the table, uh, sheriff's association were at the table, um, FOP and MAP were, were at the table. And we literally got to the point at about 11 o'clock at night where we were in support of that piece of legislation um, because we, we don't want bad police officers on, on the street either. So it made the decertification process of bad law enforcement officers more robust. The 
sponsors of the Safety Act were also sitting in um, on those Zoom meetings. And had they run the Zoom meetings um, uh, or their meetings similar to the way the Attorney General did, there's a possibility that we could have got to a point where we weren't in the position that we are right now. What I can tell you is that um, when we, um, we had come to a close to finishing up um, on, uh, on the, uh, the Attorney General's, um, I call it a licensing bill, but it's really not licensing. We're not licensed in the state, but we are certified um, and we can be decertified. Um, but we were <clears throat> doing Zoom meetings um, like Christmas Eve all the way through leading up to the, uh, uh, the lame duck session. And what the bill sponsors did was they held, I think it was seven Senate hearings, committee meetings on the various topics, use force, uh, body-worn cameras, qualified immunity, um, pretrial release and bail reform, and another number of other things. And so um, it, when you hear the proponents of this say, well, law enforcement had input, we didn't have input. We asked, you know, when we were invited to testify, uh, which I testified in, I think, three of the Senate um, hearings, well, what do you want us to talk about? Talk about whatever you want to talk about. Talk about use of force, how, however. Okay. It was clear in being on these Zoom calls that the proponents of the bill were coached and knew exactly what they wanted to, what, what the bill sponsors wanted them to, uh, to say, which really left us at, at a disadvantage. The proponents of the bill were also on these Zoom calls, so every time we tried to talk, they were chiming, chiming in and saying, you're wrong, that's not going to happen. Um, I think Senator Sims called me a fear monger in the uh, Chicago Tribune, uh, but that's okay, I'll get over it. Um, Did you ever have the legislative language? No, and that, um, so after the hearings were completed, we kind of knew what they were going to propose, but unlike the Attorney General, who actually gave us a, a draft copy of his legislation for us to look at and, and make changes to, we were left in the dark and we were only going going off of what we thought was going to be contained. So when I testified in the Senate and, and the House, that's what I was going off of. And then there were a couple amendments that were made uh, after that. Yeah, just real quick. I mean, I just remember we, so the, so the state's attorneys are all part of this, this organization called uh, the Illinois State's Attorneys Association. Um, and we, so there's, there's 102 counties in the state. And uh, two of the counties uh, have recently elected uh, prosecutors that sort of see their role as prosecutors as a little bit different than I would see my role. So one of those prosecutors is Kim Fox, and another one is Eric Reinhardt in Lake County. And so uh, what the Illinois legislature did is like, yeah, we included the state's attorney's office in our negotiations. We had Kim Fox and Eric Reinhardt at the table ignoring the fact that 100 of 102 state's attorneys uh, were apoplectic about this bill going through. And I just remember, and I just remember just the whole process, which just was so rushed and uh, just uh, um, so, just such a, a discharge of, of power. Like it went from a seven page bill on January 10th to a 764 bill on January 13th, and then it was voted on. And I just remember just sort of being part of the process and being like, they can't really be, they're not doing this, right? Like they can't really be serious about doing something this bit. And then they did it, and they did it in such a way where they just completely disregarded what uh, me, other state's attorneys, and a lot of law enforcement officers had to say. I just remember after it, I was just sort of like depressed for uh, a few days and angry um, and bewildered uh, that this is actually how things got done. And one of the th things that they said to us was, hey, this is just like that we had to get this through because, you know, it was late 2020. A lot had happened culturally and we wanted to send a message. But we know that this is a problematic bill and we're going to be uh, amending this bill over the next few years. We're going to take our time to amend it and we're going to include you guys in the discussion. Discussion. And so people say to me, well, Kennedy, why'd you wait to file the lawsuit? The reason we waited to file the lawsuit is because they kept signaling to us that we were going to be brought to the table to continue to negotiate this bill, and they never did. So, sir, let me just talk. I mean, part of that question was why the town hall now, not two years ago. Uh, just to remind folks, um, January 8th, five days before the act was brought forward, 
there were much talk in the news about what was coming, the fact that we still did not see the legislation, concern about what was happening in uh, lame duck session. Um, two days later, petitions were submitted out trying to force a public hearing and a debate on the bill. Uh, then on January 13th, um, the Senate uh, released official press statements after the Safety Act vote in the Senate, putting residents on notice that the language was now out and approved and was going to be going to the governor to take action and let the governor know that you had concerns. Um, obviously, the bill was signed shortly after its passage, so it was one of those bills in lame duck that quickly went to the governor's desk and was signed right away. The question of what, how much the staff looked at the challenges or the questions. Um, February 2nd, uh, there was um, a safety reform package submitted in legislation that, among other things, would have started working at fixing some of these changes, never brought up during uh, the General Assembly last year. April 20th, at the end of session, if you remember, we only stayed into session till April 8th because of the delayed census in the primary. Uh, it was obvious what amendments had been cleared and what decisions had not been addressed in the Safety Act. Um, a lot of petitions started late this fall, and um, then obviously the lawsuit. So for those that claim that this is only coming about here prior to the November election uh, is not the case. It's coming out now specifically because the enactment date is coming and none of those changes that were hinted at or promised are coming to fruition. So Gloria from Crystal Lake has a, a couple of questions I want to give to you. You've sort of answered before, but I want to be able to, uh, for you to answer them directly. Uh, for those of you that oppose the Safety Act, why do you believe pretrial detention should be based on how much money someone has in the bank instead of their danger to society and their flight risk? And what would your solution be to address disparate treatment that exists in the criminal justice system? Yeah, um, great, great question. So um, with regard to the first one, I think I've sort of already touched on it. I think that money bond has a role in lower level types of offenses, uh, but I ultimately would, you, we would all, you, uh, me and I think it's Lori would probably agree that we need to be making decisions with regard to who is released based on risk and not based on things like money. And I'm all for that. What I take issue with is the fact that they've narrowed out, they've carved out only certain offenses where you can be detained, and there's the vast majority of other criminal offenses where you cannot be detained even if the defendant is determined to be dangerous, okay? So we need to expand that list. So the, many of these advocacy organizations, um, they'll say things like, look, uh, the criminal justice system is inherently racist. And I'm not, I, I mean, we, we can argue about that, okay? They, the police were only arresting Irish people for the offense of murder, and nobody else got arrested. Is it a good idea to decriminalize murder? And the answer is no, okay? If there's a problem with respect to how laws are being enforced, or there's disparate treatment when it comes to enforcement of certain laws, let's address how the laws are being enforced and consider the merits of the law, whether or not it's a good law or a bad law, on their own merits. I would give you another challenge. All Many of these advocacy organizations, they hold themselves out as they are the protectors of minority communities, and they talk about black and brown communities, which of course are incredibly important, but they, they hold themselves out as they are talking on behalf of these communities. My challenge is this, go to some of these communities and ask them a simple question. Do you want more police or do you want less police? Do you want more arrests or do you want less arrests? All right, and see what the response that you get is. I guarantee you it's not what you expect and it's not what many of these advocates are claiming it is. Gloria also asked, uh, well, we can modify this slightly, why we didn't invite any Democratic lawmakers or Eric Reinhardt who supports the Safety Act and is willing to work to make necessary changes in language. You mentioned earlier Kim Fox and Eric Reinhardt. Uh, have they indicated a willingness to negotiate uh, that they admit that there are issues? I think that, I mean, I, I guess, I, so when it comes to our organization and most of the state's attorneys, 
um, you know, like everything else in the world, there's sort of just been a divide and the right hand's not so much talking to the left hand. So I can't speak for Eric Reinhardt or uh, Kim Fox, but I do know that there, and, and Senator McConchie, you can probably talk to this a little bit, there does appear to be an appetite to try to address some of the concerns that people like Chief Black as well as uh, I have, and hopefully that Hopefully that bears fruit. I guess my, my main concern would be that they should have, like, they're, they're, they always talk about, oh, the criminal justice system is broken. Like, how many, how many times have you heard that? We have a broken criminal justice system. They need to turn a critical eye to their process, okay? What they're doing in Springfield is broken. And so, th and, so th and so that's where I think we need to put our attention, and that's, I think, how we ended up with a law like this. So, so it, it, in, in relation to that, what I'll just say is this, this was designed to be your uh, local officials answering your questions about what's in the text of the bill. How are they interpreting it? They are responsible. Uh, coming up on January 1st, Chief Black is responsible for how he's going to be instructing his officers to behave differently. What is he doing in regard to that? And our state's attorney, it, how are you charging people? What are you asking judges to do? That's what this was designed to do. Not so much to be a debate, but what is it that's in the law and what's coming? Um, since we were just talking about uh, the Lake County State's Attorney, if you're familiar with his comments, can you respond to the Lake County State's Attorney's assessment of trespassing? I'm not sure which statement in particular, but if you're familiar. I, I'm not familiar with, um, with, it, with what the comment. So uh, it's an it unsigned was. question, but if someone is familiar with what you're referring to there, was it a... Uh, d d was it an assessment of what d what deems trespassing or how he thought his law enforcement in Lake County would deal with it? So uh, it could be that you can arrest somebody for trespassing. And, and Eric Reinhardt is a friend of mine. Eric Reinhardt is a nice person, and he's a good guy. We happen to disagree with regard to uh, policy things, but we there's still uh, uh, hopefully mutual professional respect. And I and I think we need m more of that kind of thing these days. But what I my guess is that he's saying is that somebody can be arrested for trespassing. I think as Chief Black pointed out, it's very difficult to do because m what it seems this law wants the police to do is merely cite people for what's called Class B and Class C misdemeanors. There is an exception as if it appears as though the person is, uh, I don't know the exact language, but either mentally ill or ha is, is like a severe damage an arrest can be made in those circumstances, but it's a pretty high bar. And Chief, I don't know if that. Yeah, I mean, I, I can read the law to you. It's a paragraph um, in the section. It says, law enforcement shall issue a citation in lieu of custodial arrest upon proper identification for those accused of traffic in class B and C criminal misdemeanor offenses or of petty and business offenses who pose no, obviously threat, no obvious threat to the community or any person or have no obvious medical or mental health issues that pose a risk to their own safety, those released on citation shall be scheduled into court within 21 days. I'm not reading anywhere in there where we can put handcuffs on them and forcibly remove them from your, your property. So um, I don't have a law degree. Um, I leave that up to Pat and, and, and his staff. But I'm reading that and I'm going, it seems pretty clear to me what I can and what I can't do and what the officers can and can't do when we're out on the street. No, 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 no. That's the we do, we do not recommend that. No, it's not. All right. So here. So so as uh, so a, as a lawyer, I can interpret that. I, I I do think, and I think this, but this is part of the confusion. Uh, but I do think that a, that if uh, if you have a person who uh, poses an obvious threat to the community or has a medical or mental health issue that poses a risk to their own safety. I think that they can be arrested. That would be my interpretation. Um, did, were, were there additional comments on the handout that was received outside that you specifically wanted to address that maybe have not come up in additional questions? And I'll let you look that over um, while we ask this. So back to the trespassing since this one's, and we'll give the state's attorney a chance to read. Um, what if I or law enforcement tell a trespasser they are in the way of your work or your maintenance equipment? Does that change the nature of it as opposed to just camping in the backyard or actively being in front of your bulldozer getting ready to push things down? 
I don't think so, um, because sometimes you see it a lot of times with uh, protesters of like, uh, you know, um, in, uh, you know, forest preserves or, um, you know, uh, state or federal parks, right? Um, I think the pipeline um, recently was one where uh, protesters were interfering with um, the workers' ability to utilize their um, their heavy machinery to to work. Um, and again, I think as, as soon as you start moving um, that piece of machinery and you hit someone, that person who's driving the piece of machinery is going to get in trouble rather than the person who is interfering with the work. Uh, and just going back to your question, the, only, the thing that, that I'd like to address is it says any offender can be held if they violate a court order regarding their conditions of release, such as committing a used crime, use, committing a new crime, using drugs or alcohol, or violating a curfew. So that's not true with respect to uh, using drugs or alcohol or violating a curfew. We can what's called revoke somebody's bail. So somebody's been released from bail, we can revoke it and then detain them only if they commit a class A misdemeanor or above. So a class A misdemeanor, class four felony, class three felony, class two felony, class one felony, or a class X felony while out on bond. For all other conditions, what the, what the law requires is that we sanction a defendant. And a sanction can be something such as a verbal admonishment. The harshest sanction can be 30 days in jail, which is day for day. So. 50% applies, so it's actually 15 days in jail. That is the harshest sanction that we can give somebody for a violation of a condition of bond. So for example, if uh, somebody, let's go back to a DUI, they've committed their eighth DUI, they're charged with a class X felony, they've been released, they're given a scram bracelet and they're instructed a condition of bond. You cannot drink, okay? You cannot consume alcohol and their scram bracelet hits for them consuming alcohol cannot revoke their bond and bring them back in. Or we have somebody who uh, is, um, you, is, is selling fentanyl in order to um, in order to fund their own in, in order to fund their own drug habit. And we say to them, look, you have to go and you have to get rehabilitation counseling and we're going to drug test you on a regular basis and you have to live in the halfway house that we're going to tell you to go live in, and they do none of those things, we cannot revoke their bond if they do not commit another Class A or above felony. So uh, that particular bullet point is not accurate. We'll try to run through some of these quick. Uh, let's see. Uh, Daniel from Barrington Hills. Does Where does restitution money come from, and how will the Safety Act affect bail money being available for restitution? We, we, you touched on the fact that it's coming, but uh, how does it affect it? And does it affect federal crimes or federal arrest and prosecute? Um, I don't know about the federal arrest or the federal prosecutors. I can't ask that. But again, restitution, uh, most, of re most restitution that goes to victims of crime in this community uh, comes from bail funds. And so that would not, uh, there, there would not be money being put into that. So the only way that there would be restitution money available would be if the county board appropriated some money to put into a fund for that purpose. So there is, uh, it, the state of Illinois has a crime victims fund, which you can apply for, and there's certain forms of restitution that you can get, uh, but the, a victim's option would be to sue a defendant civilly for uh, the damages that they've suffered as a result of their criminal conduct. Um, I know there's other sources of restitution for uh, which is either charitable or, or otherwise that, that do exist. Uh, my particular position on this would be that if you, through your criminal behavior, have caused another person to uh, you know, uh, suffer financially, that it's incumbent upon you as part of restoring justice to uh, restore them to where they were before you, before you committed the offense. Um, a couple of the competing claims in regards to the Safety Act. There are some claims that the Safety Act will lead to property tax increases. The opposing claim is that there's no property tax increase in the bill. Could you address some of the mandates that are either put on state's attorney's office, public defenders, the court system, or law enforcement that could lead to requirement for increased levies? So from a law enforcement standpoint, so <clears throat> we went to body-worn cameras before it was mandated. The, um, 
the Safety Act had a tiered implementation based on um, the uh, population served. Um, but I figured <clears throat> I wanted to get out ahead of it and have an opportunity to work through any of the bugs associated with the implementation of, of the program. But it, the mandate was unfunded, and I can tell you the City of Crystal Lake, we spent $700,000 on, uh, on body-worn cameras and, uh, and, it, and an in-car um, fleet system so that the two can interface with each other. So um, they're expensive. Um, you know, the cameras themselves um, aren't that much, but the, the cloud storage is, uh, is, uh, is what can be pricey. And uh, they say that you need about a terabyte of storage per officer per year for your body-worn camera. And I can only assume I'm not a technology person, but as the quality of the cameras increase from a high definition standpoint, that that's going to inc increase the capacity of, of the storage needed for the, uh, for the video. As far as the county is concerned, I was just trying to look up the exact figure, but it's over. So in order to comply with the Safety Act, it's going to cost the county $3 million. That all being said, you all are well represented. There is a county board member here today. You're all well represented by the county board. I believe that they've managed to absorb that cost while also keeping the levy flat. So we've talked a little bit kind of around the uh, Senator Bennett bill, that's Senate Bill 4228. Uh, question. There's several questions about this and other trailer bills that have been out there. Does how does it, how do these proposals affect the Safety Act? Good, bad, and indifferent. Uh, what's kind of missing from them? You know, in, um, any anything of that sort. I know a lot of this has been happening in negotiations behind the scenes, trying to get to a lot of the details. Is there anything that's you know, since Senator Bennett's bill has been the probably the most publicized recently? stuff that key stuff that's missing that you're like i mean this just doesn't go far enough and and here's some examples of what that is um so the the only amendment that i and this is what i want to make clear is the for for ilsa the so when we're talking about the state of illinois and uh the state's attorneys association about 40 percent of the state's attorneys in the state of illinois are democrats Okay, and the people who are negotiating the bill on behalf of the Illinois State's Attorney Associations are all Democrats. Okay, so it's Julie Reitz from Champaign County, it's Jamie Mosser from Kane County, and it's oh, and then you got Bob Berlin, but Berlin gets thrown in with everything. He's from uh, DuPage County, so um, and Bob's great. I don't mean to disparage Bob. Bob's a wonderful state's attorney. And if you live in DuPage, everybody should vote for him. But, um, but it, so, it's, so, the, so the negotiation effort is primarily on behalf of the state's attorneys, as well as law enforcement, is primarily being done by Democrats. So this is not a partisan issue with regard to some of these bail reform things. So I, the, I, so what the, the, the Bennett bill, what it does is it expands the category of, of detainable offenses, all right? And it also allows a judge to issue, so one other thing in the law is that, is, that, uh, is that if a defendant doesn't show up to court, right now the judge is like, okay, bench warrant, like go get him, you gotta be in court. What this does is it says no, you can't issue a warrant, rather you have to issue a summons, which is sort of the people that go, so people, so process servers, think about that. They go and they knock on your door and they're like, hey, you know, whereas police, if they think you're in there, they can go in and get you on a warrant. Now it's a summons, so you have to track the person down. It's a big, long process, um, and, the, and over 50% of summonses issued in McHenry County are returned not served. Okay, so you first have to issue a summons, and then only after you serve the defendant with the summons, which can be multiple. If it's if you issue a summons and it goes thirty days out, and the defendant isn't served, then you got to issue another summons. If the defendant isn't served, then you got to issue another summons. So really, if a defendant makes it a habit of just not answering their front door, they may not have to answer for criminal charges in the state of Illinois anymore. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. So it gets rid of that, and it says no, a judge can issue a warrant if a defendant doesn't comply with conditions of bond or doesn't show up to court. Um, and those are like I'm, you know, the, I think people can people can live with that. And if that's where the legislature ultimately wanted to land originally, I think we probably all could have got there. I think cash has a place 
in the bail system. That's my respectful personal opinion for the reasons uh, that I've discussed. So if the bill doesn't go, so if the Bennett bill doesn't go far enough, that's where I would say it doesn't go far enough. But ultimately, I think the Bennett bill is our sort of uh, anchor position, and they're going to chisel us back. And whether or not we can live with what ultimately comes out of the sausage making process is uh, a different question. So this question says, I'm seeing ads that victims groups are supporting this bill. Can you clarify it? Uh, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with ads to that aspect. Is anyone? Well, I, as was mentioned earlier, there are some groups, as uh, the state's attorney mentioned, that have uh, re they receive funding from the state that have you know been in support of that. Uh, but you know, there's issue of you know the fact that. We don't believe that that was one of the points that he brought up here is it did not believe that 100 percent of those groups support that i know i've talked to individual victims who have said that they did not support that who are members of some of these groups so due to the significant inconsistency or disparity in the interpretation of the act is it unfortunately going to take case law in the future to determine how police will change the way they police who will advocate for police when they are forced not to respond to a civil rights violation? So a civil rights violation takes on a whole different meaning. Um, and the reason why I say that is um, depending on the circumstance, um, if um, I walk up to somebody and I tell them verbally, you're not free to leave, I'm detaining them. By um by the Const by the Fourth Amendment, so you know I don't I don't know if there's um a change necessarily from a constitutional standpoint, but and I'm sure you've probably heard all heard the phrase paralysis by analysis, right? Um, so one of the things that I think is occurring right now is, you know, 99% of the police officers that are out there are good people. They want to do the right thing. They want to help people. That's why they got in the profession. It's the minority of the bad apples, uh, which unfortunately those are the ones that you see on TV that have tainted um, the law enforcement profession. But one thing that I can tell you, and I've been doing this for 36 years, police officers don't want to make mistakes. So if they don't know what to do, they're not going to do anything uh, because it's safer that way. It's safer for themselves and it's safer to avoid any type of um, civil litigation as a result of a, uh, a bad decision. So um, I, I think unless you know, we can clear up some of the ambiguity uh, that continues to remain in, in the Safety Act, you're going to see probably a lot of things um, continue to occur the way they are right now. Um, I mean, look at, I, I don't want to throw um, my brothers and sisters from the city of Chicago under the bus, but they can't even chase people on foot anymore. How are we supposed to keep people safe and catch criminals when we can't even try and run and apprehend them? Um, so, you know, you, for, for my Crystal Lake residents in here, you obviously have my commitment that we will continue to do the right thing and we will make sure that we police constitutionally. Um, but, you know, I can see where there might be some larger municipalities that have been under the gun, might be under a consent decree. And maybe they're just going to come into work every day with blinders on and they're going to just go from call to call to call, take their paper and go home. They're not going to make a difference in the communities that they serve. So we have uh, time for just a couple more questions. And I've got two here that I want to run through. Marie from Woodstock uh, said, I read that about half of Winnebago County's uh, citizens being held awaiting trial will be released on January 1st uh, because it will become non-detainable of offenses. Do you know the percentage of McHenry County's offenders that will be released? I know that there's been differing interpretations as to whether or not someone arrested on December 31st under one set of rules on the next day will be applied a different set or the old set. What are you looking at? Yeah. So it all depends on how the statute's interpreted. So they passed the law January of 2021, and they said the bail provisions are not going to go into effect until January 1st of 2023. So that's upon us. All right. So now the question is, I'll give you a little legal jargon here, whether or not the law applies retroactively or prospectively, okay? So if the law applied prospectively, it would only apply to people arrested January 1st and thereafter, 
everybody that had been arrested prior to that, the old bail provisions would still govern their cases. If it applies retroactively, then the new law applies to everybody. So right now, uh, McHenry County Jail has about 150 souls in it. Uh, I've run the, I've looked at the numbers back in July, and it appears as though of that 150, 30 of them are there on what would become non-detainable offenses, offenses like drug-induced homicide, things of that nature. Um, and so those 30, if it applies retroactively, would automatically be released, all right? But then with respect to the other 120, we'd have to go through this process of the petition where we'd have to file a petition. We'd have to say, judge, we, we, are, we need, judge, this defendant needs to be detained because he's a danger to a specific identifiable person. And there's no set of conditions that can get him to comply with your court order governing his release. And how many of those a judge would continue to detain is unknown. Let's say we win nine out of 10 cases. Well, then that's a additional approximately 10 people. So uh, what, so it's 40 out of 150. Uh, my, I went to law school because my math sucks, basically. So I don't know what that is, but you guys can sort of do, uh, you guys can sort of do the math. Um, so that, so, so that would be if it applies uh, retroactively. Uh, if it just applies prospectively, then nobody would be released from custody. And then, uh, Marianne, on Facebook, I want to end with this one. Uh, we've talked about a lot of the issues with the Safety Act. What are some, for both of you, what are some good parts of the act that you are like, hey, I'm glad this is there? Um, you know, the, uh, the, um, the ability to detain, the, the idea that we want, so the, the spirit of the law is actually um, um, well received by me and I think most other states' attorneys, which is, hey, like, the, the, we don't, we, we, what I want to impress upon people is that we in the justice system do this job because we're trying to help people. Right? And my job as the state's attorney is not just to prosecute people and throw them into jail. Half of my job is protecting the defendant. And my job is how you, the metric by which you measure a state's attorney's job is not how many convictions we get or otherwise, it's how well do we maintain the public trust. All right? How well do we do overall justice? And that includes taking the interests of a defendant into account when what we're doing. I do not just want to be the person that sent, I recognize that there are people that are deserving of mercy. I recognize that there are a number of people in the net that we cast who will invariably be brought into the criminal justice system who probably shouldn't be there. It's me, me and my staff do everything we can in order to identify those people and move them out of the criminal justice system, to work not just on behalf of victims, not just on behalf of law enforcement, but also on behalf of defendants and to take what is in their best interest into account doing these types of things. They come, the, one of the, and I think that that is something that is just totally overlooked. So if you're talking about changing the law such that we can make decisions based on risk to the community, as opposed to just merely how much money somebody, like that's not necessarily the worst idea, but there's so many blind spots in the law that it just keeps up for us from doing justice in so many cases. So the spirit of the law, I think, is probably good and something that, that we should begin to consider, but, uh, but, it, but how the law was passed and how the law ultimately came about, and what the law ultimately looks like just has too many problems. With respect to some of the law enforcement stuff, I know the chief can talk about it, but again, I think body cameras is a, a wonderful idea. Chief Black, there's not a single police officer that wants to tolerate bad police officers out on the street doing the wrong thing for the wrong reasons. I don't want to tolerate that. I do not want to protect those police officers, okay? Nobody does and nobody has for a very long period of time. So I think one of the things that the Safety Act does is it does help us along that line of identifying and also being able to remove police officers who are not serving the public good. No, I, I agree with what Pat said. And, you, and you know, Crystal Lake Police Department, we're a nationally accredited agency. Um, we actually had... Uh, you know, we banned chokeholds in 2011. 
Um, you know, we had duty to intervene in our in our policy way before it became a, uh, a hot topic after uh, Derek Chauvin. Um, you know, the body-worn cameras are a good thing. Um, I know I've got two of my guys back there uh, tonight, and, and uh, I could let them talk. Um, but, um, you know, since we've implemented them, um, they have been exonerated on complaints more than anything has been sustained. And it's nice for me as an administrator because I can track it. And when someone calls and leaves me a message about they want to complain on a certain officer, I can log right into their body worn camera and, and watch it and before I call them back and go, no, you're wrong. You want to come in and watch the video. I'd be happy to show it to you. Um, so, you know, th there is good things from a reform standpoint. Um, you know, the problem was is, is how they worded everything and they made, it, made, they made everything am ambiguous. And, and that's what we just continue to hope to change, that we get something that's implementable that provides an opportunity for us to give you better service, but we also have the ability to also hold our officers uh, uh, accountable when they make mistakes. Well, thank you so much for coming out tonight. We really appreciate that. We hope we answered uh, a lot of your questions. Uh, can we have a round of applause for both our state attorney and, ch and chief? And again, we will stay around and hang out for a little bit if you want to come up and ask something directly. Thank you so much for coming out and have a great night.